Chapter 2 Yurchenko's Come Over Rome, August 1, 1985 Vitaly Yurchenko, a senior KGB official, had recently arrived on a counterintelligence mission. His supposed purpose was to assess whether a U.S. Navy enlisted man was a genuine spy for the Russians. For almost two years, Thomas Hayden, a master chief at the U.S. Naval Communications Center in Naples, had been selling U.S. secrets to the KGB, who told him he was being groomed to replace John Walker as Moscow's spy inside the United States Navy. But Tom Hayden was a loyal American, a double agent on a high-risk assignment for the Navy, posing as a traitor. Three days earlier, Yurchenko, dressed in red swim trunks, a white cap, and a white polo shirt, met with Hayden on a beach south of Rome. There are too many people here, Yurchenko said. He led the way instead to a secluded area in the woods behind the beach. There, the KGB man and another agent plied Hayden with Czech beer as Yurchenko questioned him closely. Hayden was sweating. He could not tell whether the Russian was onto him or not. To Vitaly Yurchenko, perhaps it didn't matter. The meeting with Hayden was a pretext so Yurchenko could travel to Rome. On the morning of August 1st, he told his colleagues at the Soviet embassy that he was going to take a walk and visit the Vatican Museum. Instead, he slipped into a payphone across the street from the American embassy on the Via Veneto and telephoned a CIA officer. Yurchenko asked to defect. He was told to come into the embassy immediately. The Rome CIA station cabled headquarters in Langley, Virginia, across the Potomac from Washington. The word spread quickly among CIA and FBI counterintelligence officials who were gathered there for a luncheon. Yurchenko's come over. For the CIA, Yurchenko was the walk-in of a lifetime the highest-ranking KGB officer ever to defect in the entire history of the Cold War, the official in charge of the KGB's operations against the United States and Canada. The KGB closed down on October 24, 1991, two months before the Soviet Union itself came to an end. The KGB had been divided into two parts. The first chief directorate, the spies, conducted foreign intelligence the second chief directorate ran internal security and counterintelligence. Both reemerged with only the names changed as components of the Russian Federation. The spies were renamed the SVR, the Foreign Intelligence Service. The FSB, the Federal Security Service, took over internal security, counterintelligence, and anti-terrorism. To keep matters simple, in this book, in most instances, the spies are generally referred to by the familiar initials KGB, and only occasionally as the SVR, even in describing events after 1991. The man who entered the American embassy that midsummer morning had clear blue eyes, thinning red hair, and a drooping handlebar mustache. He had the big frame and broad shoulders of an athlete. He spoke good, although heavily accented English. For five years, he had been security officer of the Soviet embassy in Washington. The first question always asked of a KGB defector was whether he knew of any Soviet penetrations inside the CIA or U.S. intelligence. Yurchenko knew of two. He was flown to Andrews Air Force Base, where the CIA officer assigned to meet and take charge of debriefing him was, of all people, Aldrich Ames the chief of the Soviet counterintelligence branch. It was a frightening moment for Ames, who four months earlier had begun spying for the Russians. He must have feared that Yurchenko would walk off the plane, point his finger at Ames, and say, there he is. But there was no confrontation on the tarmac. Yurchenko did not recognize Ames. Whisked back to a safe house in northern Virginia by the CIA, Yurchenko provided information that led the FBI to Edward Lee Howard, a former CIA officer about to be sent to Moscow in 1983, when he failed a polygraph test and was fired. Angered at the agency, he sold secrets to the KGB, 
and escaped from Santa Fe to Moscow, using a pop-up dummy to replace him when he jumped from the passenger seat of the car driven by his wife, a trick he had learned in his CIA training. To reach Moscow, he used his TWA getaway card. Howard put the money he received from the Russians in a secret Swiss bank account containing upwards of $150,000. He buried an additional $10,000 in the New Mexico desert. He was granted asylum in the Soviet Union. The Russians said he died there in 2002 after he broke his neck in a fall in the Dhaka near Moscow that the KGB had provided to him. The CIA blamed Howard for betraying the identity of Adolf Tolkachev, a Soviet defense researcher and expert on stealth aircraft technology. Later, Ames also betrayed Tolkachev, sealing his fate. He was tried by a military tribunal, convicted of high treason, and executed. Yurchenko said there was another mole inside U.S. intelligence. He did not remember his name, but said the man had telephoned the Soviet embassy in January 1980 and offered to sell secrets of the National Security Agency, the nation's super-secret code and electronic eavesdropping agency. At the time, Yurchenko was stationed in Washington as the KGB officer in charge of security for the Soviet embassy. Yurchenko had taken the call and suggested the caller come to the embassy. FBI agents watching the embassy had no way of knowing who the man was. Inside the embassy, the walk-in, as volunteer spies are known, revealed sensational information. The NSA had, by using submarines, been able to tap into a Soviet underwater communications cable in the Sea of Okhotsk, between the Soviet mainland and the Kamchatka Peninsula. The United States was listening in to Soviet military communications. The highly sensitive project had been codenamed Ivy Bells. The NSA visitor offered to reveal more, but demanded payment in gold bullion. In a scene straight out of a Marx Brothers movie, Yurchenko, at first, thought the man was referring to chicken soup. The confusion was soon cleared up, but in the meantime, a Soviet electronics technician rushed into the room. He had picked up a burst of radioactivity from the FBI's walkie-talkies and radio cars. The Soviets ordered the American to shave his beard and change into Soviet work clothes. He was slipped out a side door surrounded by several Russian workmen. The group got into a van and drove away, dropping the NSA man off when they were out of sight of the embassy. The FBI was unable to identify the mysterious visitor but it began a massive hunt for him. The FBI reviewed the tapes of phone calls to the Soviet embassy and located the January 1980 conversation. It began playing the tape for NSA employees, hoping someone might recognize the voice. Finally, after 10 months, one of them said, that's Ron Pelton. Arrested, Pelton confessed his spying, was convicted at a trial, and sentenced to life in prison. A principal reason Yurchenko defected was that he pined for the woman he had known when he worked as security officer at the Soviet embassy in Washington in the late 1970s. He hoped to rekindle their romance. Valentina Yeraskovsky was a doctor married to a Soviet diplomat. They were stationed now in Montreal. Yurchenko pleaded with the CIA to see her again. Colin Thompson, a CIA officer who had participated in debriefing Yurchenko, waited in Montreal as other agency security officers took the defector to the border. Canadian intelligence officers escorted him to Montreal and watched her apartment until her husband left for a luncheon meeting. Yurchenko telephoned Yeraskovsky, and she hung up. The Canadians took him up to her apartment. She let him in briefly, but tearfully rejected his pleas to resume their relationship. Yurchenko was crushed and increasingly despondent. Three months after he arrived at Andrews Air Force Base, Yurchenko walked away from his young CIA minder in a Georgetown restaurant, made his way to the new Soviet embassy up the hill in Washington, and re-defected to Moscow. <laughs>